Hello, my name is Mr. Forrest, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Mr. Forrest. I got really drunk last week, and it appears that I have lost my sight. Oh no, that's not good, Mr. Forrest. No, that's definitely not good. I'm so sorry, Mr. Forrest. Oh no, I can't see anymore. I'm blind. I'm a blind forest. You, you... Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome to Everyday Nerd. I'm your host, Zach Steiner. Today's Nostalgia Monday. Happy Monday. If you're new around here on Mondays, we take a look at things from my personal childhood. Kind of. Today's a little bit different. This year, I played through the indie Metroidvania masterpiece that is... Wait for it, Hollow Knight. <laughs> we'll get to Ori in a second. Long story short, because I do plan on doing your everyday nerd on it, Hollow Knight is one of my favorite video games of all time now. And it's because it does literally everything I could ever want in a video game. An interesting and lived in world with intriguing and three dimensional characters. Gameplay that's phenomenal with exploration and combat both feeling incredibly rewarding. A breathtaking score by Christopher Larkin that I could listen to for hours. The insane amount of lore that I'll probably never quite understand. The hours of additional content that were put entirely in the game for free. And a game that I'm still not done playing because I'm at 111% out of 112% completion. I still have like 9 achievements left. And this is one of those very few games that I actually want to complete all the way through. Long story short, Hollow Knight is an amazing game, one that everybody should play. But I say all this because another game back in 2015 gave me very similar vibes. This was 2015's Ori and the Blind Forest, and in a pursuit to figure out which of these two Metroidvania games I love more, I decided to replay Ori again for, for the third time. See, back in 2015, I was looking through the Steam store and my eyes were immediately captivated by this trailer for a game that had just came out. It was beautiful, the music, the visuals, the gameplay, everything spoke out to me. So I knew I had to have it. Now this may sound crazy, but this was the very first game that I ever bought brand new. It had only been out for two days before I had saw the trailer, and before this, every single game that I had owned were either really, really old, it was an emulator, or it was a pre-owned game that somebody had either given me or I'd bought for a few bucks at GameStop. So while yes, it's very hard to have nostalgia for a game that's only four years old, I would argue that this one's a little bit different because it holds such an important place in my gaming history. This was the very first brand new game that I bought. And so I kind of have nostalgia for it, especially considering I wouldn't go and buy another brand new game until 2017 with Cuphead, The End is Nigh, The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, along with the Switch. Before I bought all of these games, Ori and the Blind Forest was the very first one. And even then, that's not all I think about when I think about the emotional journey that this game puts you through. It's a depressive yet hope-filled experience that I heavily relate to for so many reasons. I can't help but think that I simultaneously played Ori for the first time 16 years ago and just yesterday. But savvy stuff aside, Ori just released on the Switch recently, there's a sequel coming up soon, and I wanted to replay it since I played Hollow Knight to figure out which game I liked more. So let's take a look at Ori and the Blind Forest. If you don't know anything about it, Ori and the Blind Forest is a 2015 Metroidvania developed by Moon Studios and published by Microsoft, meaning that it was a PC and Xbox exclusive. A year later, it got a definitive edition, which added an additional area and fixed a couple of logistical issues with the original version. And now, in 2019, you can play Ori on the Switch, which means that you can cry to this opening while on the toilet. From the very first 10 minutes, I knew that this game was something special. By the way, spoilers for the beginning of Ori. When you start this game, you're in the midst of a great storm. A feather floats to a beautiful sung melody composed by the amazing Gareth Coker, and you hear a deep voice narrator speaking in a language that seems ancient. You then take the control of a large mysterious creature named Naru, finding your way to the feather that transforms into a small, somewhat monkey-like animal. This is Ori. 
Fast forward some time and you take control of Ori. You leave the cave and it's clear that these two characters have bonded in a mother-child relationship. You bounce with joy, seasons change, and unfortunately, on one fateful night, the skies ablaze and this forest begins to die. In one of the saddest moments I've ever seen in a video game, Naru goes out to search for food when she can only find a single piece of fruit. She returns home to give it to Ori, only for her to pass out right afterwards. Ori realizes that his mother needs something to eat, so he sets out to find some more food. After finding a nice stash, he returns, only to find out that his mother is now dead. Stricken with grief, Ori also loses his strength, only for him to draw his last breath. It's at this point that I didn't quite know what this game wanted me to think. I mean, this is depressing. This is sad. And this is such a powerful opening for a video game. And yet, we end up getting hope. It's at this point that the narrator, which is the large spirit tree in the forest, gives Ori a newfound strength, waking up from his death and giving him a new purpose, to save the forest. And this is when the game truly begins. This opening was everything I needed to reassure me that my $20 were spent well on this game. And yes, only $20 for a brand new game. I am still kind of surprised that this wasn't at least 40. I was shocked at how emotionally charged this introduction was and how beautifully it sets up this entire world. I should also mention that it was particularly weird for my first time playing this game because I was playing it on about a three-year-old laptop that lagged and it didn't have a whole lot of RAM. There wasn't a graphics card. And so my entire playthrough of this game for the first time was at entirely half the frame rate of the actual game. And for some reason that should have bothered me more, yet it didn't. Like you can actually see footage of the Let's Play that I recorded of this. I finished the whole thing. It was like 30 something parts because it took me so long to get through that game. But man, was it worth it. Of course, I've since played it a couple more times on much better hardware, but it just goes to show you that even if the game doesn't run that well, if it's a good game, it's still gonna be a good game. The amount of detail in Ori is phenomenal to say the least. The animations, the backgrounds, the cutscenes, everything is just so beautiful that even if you don't like Metroidvanias, I'd be hard pressed to say that this isn't something you should check out. But let's talk about the Metroidvania side of things. I mean, this is a game after all, and in order to enjoy a game, you must enjoy playing it. At first, playing as Ori is a little bit hard to get used to. There's a little bit of floatiness to the jumping. You have a lack of abilities early on. Just like any Metroidvania, your goal is to open up new locations, explore as much of the world map as possible, and find and level up different abilities to make exploration and combat that much more rewarding. When it comes to exploration, Ori really doesn't do that much different from other Metroidvanias. The difference is in its presentation. Like I've said, probably way too much already, this is a beautiful game. Almost everything you see is absolutely breathtaking, and the way you engage with this world helps facilitate an even better experience. Your movement as Ori starts slow at first, but as you play and find new abilities, you find yourself moving through areas in such a fluid and satisfying way. Of course, you've got your typical wall jumps, double jumps, and the like, but you can also get Kudo's Feather, which allows you to glide. There's the charge jump that lets you charge left and right across walls. There's the incredibly useful bash ability that lets you fly through the air by using the momentum of a nearby lantern, creature, or projectile. And in the definitive edition, you get a dash which lets you move through areas rather quickly. Speaking of the definitive edition, about a year after the game had released, the definitive edition launched. I think you got it for free. I don't really remember. I may have just bought it again. I don't know. I love the game enough 
to where that wouldn't have been a problem. I'm probably gonna get this on the Switch at some point. The Definitive Edition added a brand new area, it gives you the dash, and it added a bit more lore to Naru's story. Honestly, besides this extra content, the thing I was most appreciative in the Definitive Edition was the fact that you could go back and play the game more after you complete it. See, in the original version, if you didn't 100% the game by the time you finished the main story, you just would be locked out of that save file and you couldn't go back and finish it. That was very frustrating because I think I got like a 98 or a 99%. I only needed to go back and get a couple of things, but they locked me out of the game. Fortunately, they fixed that with the Definitive Edition and I've gone back and re 100 percented it like two or three times now. When it comes to the other side of Ori's gameplay, its combat is something that I would consider very serviceable. It's not bad by any means, but it's also not that amazing. In fact, this is the first thing that I would consider a weakness in Ori in the Blind Forest. I think part of this has to do with its very simplistic nature. The combat revolves almost entirely around the Spirit Flame, your very first core ability. You can upgrade this and it lets you attack multiple enemies at once or shoot enemies quicker, but that's really about it. Sure, you do get a stomp ability that lets you damage enemies underneath you, and there's the charge flame, which is just a charge version of the spirit flame, but I feel like the combat system here is very underdeveloped and it's just one of the things that 2017's Hollow Knight does significantly better. Another thing that Hollow Knight does exceptionally well is its enemy designs are wildly varied and extremely memorable. In Ori, the enemies are probably my only other major complaint besides the combat, because while this world is gorgeous, these enemies just feel out of place and there's nothing really special about them whatsoever. I only make this comparison because while I still do love this game, there really isn't a whole lot of innovation in Ori. If you've played any Metroidvania in the past, you're not really getting anything new here. Ori excels in its presentation, sure but it keeps a fairly consistent formula with its genre predecessors in terms of exploration, and I would even argue is a bit lackluster in its combat system. Now, that's not to say that there aren't any memorable moments though. Like I said, I really enjoy the fluidity of Ori's movement, and that can really be expressed in this game's three major dungeon-like areas that you find yourself going to throughout the course of the narrative. The Genzo Tree, Forlorn Ruins, and Mount Horu are all areas outside of the world map, and as you enter them, you're faced with some more precise platforming, additional item gathering, and usually a new ability. Playing through these areas are fun enough, but what I really enjoy is when you're escaping. Much like the end of a Metroid game, you must jump and weave your way through obstacles as you escape from these areas in one of the most cinematic and engaging moments in video games. Now, usually I don't like to play extended clips on this show because I want to make sure that you're not bored and you're enjoying what I'm talking about, but this is one of those instances where I feel like it serves the show best by showing you a full clip of escaping the Genzo tree. Pay attention to the music and the obstacles and especially right at the end, I'll just, I'll just let you watch it for yourself. The first time I escaped the Genzo tree, I was relieved, exhilarated, and downright impressed. The amount of things happening on the screen at one time is incredible, and what's even crazier is that if you're perfect in the game, you can leave the Genzo tree at the exact same moment that the music is about to loop. It felt like everything I had done at that point was leading me to this particular moment in time. You see, Ori and the Blind Forest is a game about emotions. The sadness at the beginning, the anxiety and exhilaration in the escape sequences, and the constant bittersweet melancholy moments of hope that just fill the entire narrative. I don't want to give away too much of the story, but I will say that yes, there is technically an antagonist. It's a little bit sad and it's a little bit different than you would expect. There really isn't a final boss, in fact there really isn't any bosses at all in this game. There's only a handful of characters with very little dialogue, especially in between characters since these are animals in a forest. 
But at the end of the day, Ori is about loss and grief and pushing yourself through those obstacles for the betterment of yourself, your surroundings, and everybody else. I don't want to get too real here because I do like to make these episodes more comedic and I know there hasn't been as many jokes this episode, but after playing Ori again, I recognize a lot of the same emotions that occur throughout this game I have also gone through throughout this past year. See what's crazy is that it recently was the one year anniversary for your everyday nerd. We've put out 108 episodes now, over 11,000 views. And a lot of new people have just came to watch this show and that's meant the world to me. But what you may not know is that this past year has been one of the most difficult years of my life. I started the show and then three days later, a family event happened in my life that really kind of caused me to go off the rails a little bit. And what I mean is I felt a lot of depression. It was very hard for me to have motivation for anything, even including this show. And while I'm very proud of getting this far in the show, it was not easy. And I really couldn't have done it without any of you watching. Not only did this event cause my mental health to dwindle, but I had also just dropped out of college, even though I could have graduated. I moved in with a roommate, my best friend Damien from high school, and I started this crazy, wild, creative entrepreneurship route where like, I'm paying my bills solely off of the things that I create and the people that I work with. And it's not easy, it's been very difficult. And so when that also happened last October, and I was also really excited to start working on this show, it just became really, really difficult to get through a lot. I say all this because I recently just got out of my depressive slump. It hasn't been perfect. I'm still working on a lot of issues. I'm still trying to figure out my finances. There's still gonna be a lot of progress that needs to be made for a long time for me to be like 100% there, but I will say, that over the past couple months, I have been trying much harder than I have in the entire last year. And it feels good. It feels really, really good. And replaying this game, especially since I started replaying it while I was still really depressed and finishing it after coming out of that depressive slump, it kind of gave me like some similar emotions to how I'm feeling in real life. Ori in the Blind Forest may not be an innovation in its genre, it might have some issues with its combat system being underdeveloped. I may not care for the enemy designs. I may have had a much better experience and overall enjoyment with Hollow Knight, but this game speaks to me on a certain level beyond just its visuals and its musically engaging moments. It tells a captivating and almost inspiring story of this little monkey-like creature just trying to save a forest. And for that, it still remains to be one of my favorite games of all time. Well, I guess I'm a sellout now. I'm not really gonna sell you anything in this episode. I will say go check out the Patreon if you haven't already. There are new tiers and new perks and all that kind of stuff. A lot more affordable than it has been in months and I'm really excited to see some of the things coming out of the Patreon recently. But besides that, I just wanted to personally thank everybody for watching for the past year. I can't believe I've done a year of this show. I can't believe we reached 100 episodes. I mean, I had hoped to have like 300 episodes. I wanted to do it every single day but I think it's better for not trying to do that. I think we've put out some much more memorable episodes in the past couple months because I spent a little bit more time on it. And I definitely know that like my personal life and my, my business life and all of that kind of stuff definitely could not have handled an episode every day like I had aspired. Either way, Your Everyday Nerd is gonna be continuing for a very long time. Out of all of the crazy projects that I do, and I do a lot of them, I can't see this one going away anytime in the near like five years. I honestly could do this for a very long time and I'm super excited to see what this show has in store for it in the near months. It's almost 2020. 
that's kind of crazy. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this episode. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button. If for whatever reason you didn't like it, you can hit the dislike button. That's all the time we have for left today. I will see you in the next one.